and the, one of the faculty members in uh, the geriatrics division in the uh, Department of Medicine. And I am a full-time VA physician who works in mostly in home care, but also in the memory disorders clinic, which Dr. Boyle and Cordes and I developed um, some years ago just because we were seeing such a need for that. So a lot of it, my interest in this comes from, from working in that clinic for over 10 years. So my talk is about um, whether it makes sense to try to make a specific diagnosis of Lewy, of Lewy body dementia versus other dementia types. And I'll, I'll try to convince you that it does because I think, I think it's, um, it is useful. Uh, I kind of learned best by, from actual patients and real experiences, so I'm going to start with a, a real case. Sometimes I make these up, I'm gonna, I'm, I'll be honest. This actually is real and nothing in here has been made up. So this is a gentleman, he was, he, he's 82 years old, Mr. C. Uh, he has diabetes, hypertension, heart failure, paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, chronic kidney disease, and he supposedly has had a, a TIA, a little mini stroke, sometime in the past. Uh, his history is also positive for intermittently severe hypertension, uh, and with, but at the same time, very severe drops in his blood pressure when he stands up. And this has been going on for three years, and it's been so bad they've worked him up for some rare diseases like pheochromocytoma, so adrenal tumors and things like that, uh, because of these dramatic blood pressure swings. Um, we just started with a, we're just starting our case. The first facts are here. So, so there's not, you haven't missed anything significant. Uh, talking about this, this man that was admitted to my home care program in October of 2006. Uh, he, he, was, had, he was on amlodipine, aspirin, clopidogrel, calcium, vitamin D, fludrocortisone, simbicide, <coughs> furosemide, potassium, and olanzamine for, olanzamine for quote, sundowning or, or nighttime confusion. So when I, that was what I found from his chart. When I, when I talked with him, these were things that he told me. Uh, he had a, a friend who was with him, and then she told me that he, he thrashes and yells so loudly in his sleep that all the, the, other, the other neighbors in the trailer park complain about the screaming and crashing at night that they can hear next door and next door. Um, he described himself nightmares, these vivid, violent images that seemed real for a few minutes after he woke up. Then he would actually throw his body out of bed and break the furniture and then wake up frightened and barricade himself in his room before he kind of realized, oh yeah, that was a dream. Um, he also got up to urinate four times a night. He had a history of frequent falls. And, and he, he said, you know, my memory's just not very good. There, there's something wrong there. So that, those are the things he told me about. Um, on exam, when he, when he was lying down, his blood pressure was 135 over 90. When he stood up, it went to 98 over 70. His heart rate didn't change. Uh, so he had a regular heart rate, occasional extra beats. He had a, a soft systolic heart murmur and maybe a, a third heart sound. He had a little ankle edema. He also had a wide-based gait and kind of a stooped posture and short steps when he walked. Um, his labs, remarkable for a creatinine of two, which is a pretty bad kidney function, actually. Uh, normal B12 folate uh, uh, test for syphilis, uh, all of those were normal. And he did have a little right subcortical stroke on his old old subcortical stroke on his CAT scan. So that's that's the, the patient. Um, when I did some testing, his mini middle was 22 out of 30. Uh, he had a high school education, um, and I actually had sent him for neuropsych testing, and he had mild impairments of attention and recent memory, moderate impairment of visual spatial function, and some impaired processing speed. Uh, and he told the psychologist he would physically act, act out of the and fight with ghosts and demons uh, in the night. Uh, and he had a past history of hallucinations, something that didn't come up when I talked with him, other than these nightmares. So what information would you want to, want to determine, okay, so he has some cognitive impairments, is he demented? Uh, uh, this is more aimed toward um, residents or fellows. So. Uh, but we're just talking today Maybe. about so, yeah, so I'm not, not going to ask. What I was going to ask them and what I was trying to get at was, you would want to know, is he functionally impaired by these no, I mean, yeah, this, Do they actually make a difference in his ability to do his normal activities or not? And in his case, he was having some difficulty with finances and with um, ma managing his medications. So, yes, he, yeah, they, the deficits were significant enough perhaps to say he had a dementia. 
Um, so with the wisdom of 2006, I diagnosed him as having a vascular dementia because, you know, he had risk factors and he had a little stroke on his scan. I tried to manage those risk factors. I tried to taper the olanzapine, uh, and can, you know, just keep him on the clopidogrel for stroke prevention, and then try to reduce fall risk in any way that I could for him. And we'll come back to the case later. So that's, that's just, that's our patient. When I, when I looked at um, different dementia types and estimates, the, this is just aggregated from my review of the literature, cross-sectional studies, uh, about 60% Alzheimer's, 20% Lewy body, 14% vascular, and 6% other. It's just kind of the ranges that I came up with um, reviewing the literature. I wanted to show you what a Lewy body lesion looks like, uh, that round kind of pink thing there. So there are these, these uh, round inclusions that contain um, abnormal neurofilaments and also contain tau and ubiquitin. Uh, what's interesting is they're not just in the brain. They're in nervous system tissue in multiple other areas. So the panel A shows Lewy bodies in the sinoatrial node in the heart. Um, B shows in the esophagogastric junction. C in the adrenal medulla. And then D in the celiac ganglion. So you can see how this could have widespread effects beyond um, just memory problems if they're, if they're throughout your autonomic nervous system. The main component is this uh, compound called alpha-synuclein, which is a protein. It's, it's normally an unfolded single protein, but it can fold and it can aggregate together in all sorts of forms and be uh, in various places in the nerve and form these Lewy bodies. Um, what, what's one interesting thing is that there are, there are other diseases other than Lewy body d disease that have pathologies in this, this substance. Parkinson's uh, is, is characterized by the Lewy bodies, but then also multiple system atrophy, essential tremor, and um, Gaucher disease, and other lysosomal storage diseases also have pathology in this, this substance. So again, this is more for, um, this is sort of what we were talking about in clinic this morning. So how do you say if somebody who has cognitive impairment is demented? And that's what this is going over a stable decline from a previous level of function. So that would exclude people who have developmental disabilities who have always had those, those, are, those, that's not considered a dementia in the usual sense. So that's to be a decline. It has to be bad enough to interfere with independent functioning in that person's life and not be caused by a delirium or a primary, you know, reversible psychiatric illness. So, um, we didn't talk today about what the criteria for Lewy body dementia were, so we didn't actually um, didn't ask you those. So I'm, I'm not going to put you on the spot now. You're, you're you're unfortunate to be the only resident here today. Um, do you, I'll did, try. Okay. Um, hallucinations usually of the animals or small people and other things. Um, waxing and waning mental course. Um, mm -hmm. We'll be fine one minute and then I'll do the next. Um, it didn't have symptoms of Parkinson's, but it could have symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Um, um, you, you've done very um, well. You've got the three core or, features right like that. What other, what other things have you pointed out? Um, well, I know one thing that we've, we've um, that we asked them about are do they have REM sleep behavior disorder, mm -hmm. and that can increase the risk um, for dementia. Okay. Okay. So well. You've set this up perfectly, so <laughs> thank you. Um, so, there are core features and suggestive features. Uh, first, you have to qualify that to actually have dementia, as we talked about. But the core features, as you, as you said, are Parkinsonism, visual hallucinations, and these fluctuations in status, uh, much more dramatic than people with Alzheimer's have. So, so uh, often people will think that they, the person has had a seizure or a stroke because they're just so different from one day to another. Uh, and you know, I've. I've I've seen that where we, we, we track the cognitive scores as we see people in memory clinic, and these patients often have these just huge fluctuations, uh, you know, from one visit to the next. There are also some suggestive features: uh, severe sensitivity to neuroleptics, uh, rib sleep behavior disorder, and then reduced um, basal ganglia dopamine uptake on functional imaging, which is not something we do very much here, but it is part of the. Um, Form, part of the list of formal criteria. So 
with these criteria, if you have greater than two core features required for a diagnosis, it's 85% sensitive, 73% specific. But if you put REM sleep behavior disorder into the core features, it actually improves the sensitivity. Um, and you keep the same specificity. So um, now, in 2005, they actually changed the, um, the criteria so that you could have one, one core and one suggestive instead of needing two core features to make a diagnosis. I have a REM sleep behavior disorder video, but it's on my, um, my laptop. I can show you. Um, and you can just kind of pass it around and, and just hit go and watch it. It was embedded in the presentation, but in, oh, in the transfer, the, well, in the transfer, uh, we didn't have time to transfer that. So I'm going to cue it Does here. Does still have a box in there? Yeah, that, that that would probably be. I said I can cue it. People just pass it around and hit play. It's very short, and while while I talk about stuff. Okay. Okay. So. So, it doesn't have, it has sound, but the sound's out there. You just watch the, the rim sleep behavior disorder. Yeah, you don't need sound for this. <laughs> yeah, um, no. Uh, it, what's weird, when I went looking for this stuff, it was kind of hard to find, and you would be shocked to find out how many people videotape their dogs and cats while they sleep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, there were so many dog and cat oh, things like, like this on, the, on YouTube, oh, yes. So, and rim sleep behavior disorder wasn't described until like the late 1980s or 90s. Uh, so, so it's a relatively recent thing. So what's the difference between uh, Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's dementia since Lewy body has Parkinsonism, they both have Lewy bodies. Um, that, that was one question. Some uh, people would speculate that if the movement disorder preceded the cognitive disorder, then you most likely um, assume because um, Parkinson's dementia did not appear until several years after. Right. So you're, you're right on track with that. So it's kind of an arbitrary distinction. So to be called Parkinson's disease dementia, the motor impairment precedes the dementia by a year or more. Um, whereas with dementia with Lewy bodies, the motor and cognitive impairment appear within one year of each other. Um, the majority of patients who present with more classic Parkinson's disease do, the majority do develop a dementia within 10 years. So, um, so I wanted to talk for a minute about these diagnostic tools that we rarely use. Um, Dr. Royal talks a lot about MIBG SPECT, but um, we don't have access to it. It's, these tests are reimbursed in Europe and in Japan, so they are used a lot, in the, and that's where most of the literature comes from. Uh, and then there's a, 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 a dopamine, the, the dopamine imaging is the second one. So MIBG is iodine 1, 2, 3, metro iodo benzyl guanidine, which is, you know, why they just say that. Uh, so it's an analog of guanethidine, so it's taken up by the post-ganglionic presymptomatic adrenergic nerves. When the nerve depolarizes, it gets released, but it doesn't get metabolized. So you actually can see sort of what the noradrenergic innervation is in life. Um, it was de developed as a technique to look at cardiac sympathetic innervation in people with really bad heart disease. So, but because, remember, Lewy body patients have autonomic system involvement early in the, in the course of the disease, it, it might, it was thought that it might be an imaging set, um, technique that would work for that as well. So there's two meta-analyses that have been published about this. Um, in the last few years, Dr. Boyle and his colleagues here published one of the major ones, and then there was a group in Italy that published a major meta-analysis of the, all the MIBG studies. So, just wanted to point out what, what this is talking about. What it does, the image is take, taken up, again, sympathetic um, nerves, and then you look at the myocardial or heart to mediastinum ratio, and it should be in the heart and not in the mediastinum. So the heart is here and just the, you know, the center of the mediastinum up here, and then calculate. And these are normal. This is what normal looks like. <coughs> these are two abnormal scans. Um, the one on the left is someone who subsequently went under, had a heart transplant mm -hmm. for a severe failure. This is a person who had severe heart failure and died. 
and you, you can see that both of those, there's not much difference between the, um, the intensity of the, in, the uptake here versus here and here versus here. So those are abnormal scans. So this is, this is from Dr. Royal's study, and what they were looking at was to see whether this, in a meta-analysis, whether this technique could differentiate the different types of dementia from each other and from normals. And so they were looking at what, what ratio would be the best for that. So things actually clustered into three groups pretty neatly. Um, the normals, Alzheimer's, progressive supranuclear palsy, and... Um, all clustered in the normal range, actually up at around two. The Parkinson, Lewy body, and room sleep behavior disorder all clustered really low, less than 1.5. And then the frontotemporal and vascular were kind of somewhere in the middle. So the ratio that they found that was the best was around 1.8. Um, the other, the Italian study just used, had a larger sample that just calculated sensitivities and specificities of an abnormal MIBG in um, diagnosing, compared it with a with diagnosis of Lewy body and it found it had good sensitivity and specificity. This, the um, dopamine imaging study, I'm not going to say this one, I practiced it, but I'm not, <laughs> and I can, uh, but it, it's called DAT scan and it's trademarked. And it, it, it has a high affinity for uh, presynaptic dopamine transporter in the brain. And so that's how you can manage those. And has, has again, fairly good sensitivity and specificity. This is what these look like. Um, and so what, they, what you compare is imaging brightness in the cutamen versus kind of everywhere else. And so this, this is normal. These are all, the others are all abnormal patterns where you don't have that sharp distinction. So anyway, those are the, those are the, the imaging studies that we occasionally but don't, don't often use. Um, one of the things that, that's said, and I wanted to see if it was true, is that survival is lower, you know, in Lewy body than some of the other dementias. And so there, there are some studies about, this is from a woman named Malik Williams at Washington University where they have these longitudinal aging studies. And um, comparing survival between those two diagnoses, the top graph are just age and uh, mortality, and then the, the bottom graph breaks it down by gender. And uh, so, yeah, they're, they're the uh, Alzheimer's are on the, the dark and the, to the right and the blue body. You can see that there are differences. And so the people who live the longest are women with Alzheimer's and the people who die the fastest are men with blue body disease and the other two categories are in between. And that's adjusted for kind of cognition or point in the disease course. There was this is a, an interesting study because when you think about survival, it's not really the only important endpoint. This was a prospective study where they took consecutive people with dementia, either Alzheimer's or Lewy body, from a, a group of clinics and did a comprehensive fall risk assessment and followed them for a year and did other, other kinds of assessments too. And then they found that um, their, their, their endpoints were time to um, death or hospitalization with pneumonia or fall. And I think those are clinically really important outcomes. That's probably mine, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to answer it. And um, <laughs> again, what, what we, you can see is that um, the, the Alzheimer's patients had a much longer time till they had one of these bad things happen than the, um, the Lewy body patients did. And then finally, this is specifically focused on falls, and again, um, time, time to first fall. And so, controls Alzheimer's, vascular, Lewy body, and Parkinson's. And you see that the Lewy, each group is different from the others, but the Lewy body and Parkinson's are, are the fallers, uh, very, very largely. So, I mean, understanding that about your patient and how high a risk they are for falling, I think, is important. So why might people with body with dementia be more likely to fall? Um, because of the autonomic instability. That's that's one big reason. Because car, you know, from cardiovascular standpoint, they may faint or they may get really weak from orthostatic hypotension and fall. So, um, I don't know if their hallucinations could. Yeah, so they could be reacting to their hallucinations. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> they definitely could. That could happen. Um, 
So the Parkinsonism and rigidity is a, is a, so if they have that as a component that's prominent with their Lewy body disease, that could, that could clearly make them fall. And the other is, I guess the only other thing is that they tend to have greater visuospatial deficits because of occipital lobe involvement. Mm -hmm. And so, again, they, they, especially things in the lower part of their visual field may have more difficulty with. So all those reasons make sense why they would, they would fall. Um, I think you covered everything. <laughs> That's good. Um, the next complication I wanted to talk about was delirium. Uh, I mean, we know that people, people with any kind of dementia are at increased risk for delirium. Uh, and we know that people who get delirious are at subsequent risk to be diagnosed with dementia. Uh, I, well, we, what, what I didn't know before this, but you kind of suspect, because delirium kind of sounds like Lewy body dementia in a way. When you think about it, they have perceptual disturbances, they have fluctuations. Um, may, you know, maybe there's a common mechanism there. So, but whether different types of dementia patients have different risks. And so there's this case control study from England. I like it. The, the, the cerebral function unit at Newcastle upon Tyne where they took matched Alzheimer's and Lewy body patients and then did a case control study to see whether they had experienced delirium because they had all their records while, while hospitalized and about a quarter of the Lewy body had, whereas only 7% of the Alzheimer's patients had. So uh, and that was a significant difference. And the Lewy body patients were also more likely to have multiple episodes of delirium. So it does look like it, it probably is a, a risk factor, but even greater than <coughs> dementia itself um, for delirium. Somebody mentioned the types of hallucinations. Um, and there's actually, there are actually studies where they catalog these things, and the, the, it is one of the diagnostic features. The, mo the most common co content are, are what I listed, anonymous people, animals, body parts, you know, hands, faces, things like that. Not necessarily gross body parts, but just <laughs> <laughs> floating things. Uh, children, friends and family, and mechanical things. They're often miniature. Uh, um, they can be anything from really terrifying, like I had, had one patient where, you know, it was the flying spider spitting, spitting poison, you know, to, I had one person who I said, you know, do you ever see anything that's not there? And it's like, well, yeah, there's this plant outside my window, and it get, grows while I watch it, and then it starts to dance, and I said, well, does that bother you? He said, oh, no, no, it's like watching a movie. And it's like, okay. And, you know, so... Um, but often they're like, say, little children or dancers or animals. Yeah. There's, you know, neuroleptic sensitivity is one of the suggestive features of Lewy body disease. And, um, you know, I, I talk to uh, students and, and residents and fellows. It's like, oh, if you're going to prescribe a neuroleptic, you know, they're going to be very sensitive to it. They may have a bad reaction. And I, I've, this is the first time in preparing this, I went back to see, you know, what is that based on? Is there really any data uh, about that? And so there, there was. Uh, there was an autopsy series in the early 90s uh, where they had 21 Alzheimer's patients and 21 Lewy body confirmed autopsy cases. And then they, again, had complete medical records and, on these patients. And... Um, the, what they found were that um, the Lewy body patients uh, were much more likely to have hallucinations uh, and delusions than the Alzheimer's patients. So you can see that they're more likely to get put on a neuroleptic uh, because of the symptoms they have. And then uh, of those who got neuroleptics, 81% of the Lewy body patients had, a, had an adverse reaction versus only 29% of the Alzheimer's patients. So um, when, they're, when they were talking about adverse reactions, they were, it was anything from a severe neuroleptic malignant syndrome to just getting a little stiff. Uh, so, I mean, it, it wasn't quite as terrible as it sounded. And these were all with thioridazine and haloperidol, the old drugs that we rarely use anymore. Um, although, so, um, yes, they are more sensitive to neuroleptics, but with the newer drugs, the, the degree of problems is probably less than what we, what we reported in this study. The REM sleep behavior disorder that I passed around, again, is now incorporated into the diagnostic criteria uh, for the disease. It wasn't described until 1986. It, it's, it's hard to imagine that, that in sleep medicine, 
Um, when they autopsy people who had a prior diagnosis of REM sleep behavior disorder and then, you know, someday die of something else, um, they find on autopsy 50%, 6% had diffuse Lewy bodies, 18% uh, had, you know, the particular um, findings uh, diagnostic for Parkinson's and 11% had multiple systems atrophy, which is, it's kind of scary if you have rib sleep behavior disorder to look at that. Um, there was a, another study showing that 70% um, of um, people with rib sleep behavior disorder followed out for, for seven years, 70% converted to have one of these neurologic diseases. This is my VA phone that I actually have to answer. I'm a if I can find it. Um, so, when we're talking about the autonomic um, nervous system, I mean, these are some of the things that, that it can lead to, these problems can lead to. Syncopate falls, you know, hip fractures, atrial fibrillation, constipation, drug sensitivities, uh, delirium, and then, you know, incontinence. Uh, like I say, so these patients probably have higher prevalence of these problems at earlier stages than people with Alzheimer's or would. And then the final thing, when you think about these behaviors, um, you, kind of, you know, we have this, at least in the memory clinic, it seems like these patients are harder to take care of. Uh, and sort of why might that be? Um, you know, fluctuations from day to day, hallucinations, psychosis, I think would be very stressful for caregivers. Um, there's not, there, I found a, some, just some very small studies, um, one where they actually matched uh, caregivers of individuals with either of those diagnoses based on their age, their gender, their relationship, and the level of dementia of the, involved, of the person. 30% um, of the caregivers in both groups had depression, uh, however, 12% of the Lewy body caregivers versus none of the Alzheimer's caregivers had severe depressive symptoms. Um, early stage uh, caregivers for people with Lewy body dementia report higher levels of distress related to the delusions, hallucinations, and anxiety that the, the patients have. So I wanted to follow up a little bit with our, our patient. Um, this, he was hospitalized in 3 of 07 with increased weakness and falls, and he went to a nursing home. He was admitted again that year with, quote, TIAs and got a right lower load pneumonia. He was admitted in 08 with a, a supraventricular tachycardia and hypotension. He was admitted again that year with a methicillin-resistant uh, staph pneumonia. He was admitted in 09 with a femoral neck fracture and went to a nursing home for rehab and then died in the nursing home two months later. And so, I mean, this is kind of the natural history and all the complications that you see with this disease um, kind of manifested in this, this one individual's life. <coughs> so the next thing I wanted to talk about was dementia drugs and Lewy body disease. Uh, are they likely to cause help or harm? You know, we have, we have Aricept, we have Galantamine, we have um, Exelon patches. Um, yeah, they do. They do. So the rationale for why they help is that the choline and acetyltransferase is actually more depleted in the brains of people with Lewy body than Alzheimer's, and that's what these drugs help with. At the same time, the, the receptors that respond to these drugs are relatively preserved. So you actually have more potential for efficacy. Um, so there are two randomized trials, or there are randomized trials of ribostigmine and denepazil. Uh, they're not head to, they're not, there are not head-to-head -head comparisons of these drugs. Um, in terms of what's formally approved, denepazil and galantamine and ribostigmine are all approved for Alzheimer's. Ribostigmine, which comes in oral or patch, is approved for Parkinson's disease dementia also. None of them have a formal approval for Lewy body dementia. But, but, you know, if you were going to go with what has the best evidence, you would go with ribostigmine just because it's gone through the rigors of being approved for Parkinson's dementia. But they all have the potential to work. There was a randomized trial of ribostigmine. They looked at computerized cognitive assessments and the neuropsychiatric inventory. Uh, 
and particularly this measure of scores for delusions, apathy, hallucinations, and depression, which would be very important targets. And these are the percent with um, greater than 30% improvement in the, on that main outcome measure. So the, the most rigorous would be the intention to treat analysis, which is on the left, rivastigmine versus placebo. So about 48% of rivastigmine versus about 28% of the placebo had a significant improvement in that behavioral measure. Cognitive speed with the rivastigmine did improve, uh, and it got worse on placebo. And then kind of after the washout, kind of headed back toward baseline. There was also a randomized trial of denafazil with doses of 3, 5, or 10 milligrams, and they used some, some very familiar, the mini mental, the caregiver burden scale, and the NPI, that, like the other tests we used. And this is a little hard to see, um, but it has some different doses, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to even try to, to do that. What I can say about a denepazil and um, response is you get a substantially greater response than you did in the Alzheimer's studies. Like for example, on the mini mental, you get maybe a half a point out of 30 with 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 Alzheimer's, and and you know two or three times that with a Lewy body patient. So they may be more worthwhile in that population. So treatment of psychosis and hallucinations. Um, do we have to always treat them? Nope. Uh, no. Uh, so if they're significantly distressing to the patient, or are there serious safety concerns to the patient, the family, or the professional staff who have to work with that person, um, then there's a reason to treat them. Um, first thing to do is discontinue any cholinergic drugs or any other drugs that might be worsening their mental status, and then consider one of these cholinesterase inhibitor drugs. Uh, if that doesn't work and the concerns are serious enough about the patient's discomfort or safety, then you could consider an atypical neuroleptic drug. You do need to, you know, be aware of the black box warning, which is reproduced here, increased mortality in elderly patients with dementia-related psychosis um, treated with these drugs, increased risk of heart attack, death, and stroke, and infections and pneumonias. And you, and you need to document that you counseled the family about this. I had one other, one other um, drug I found that when I was trying to, to see is there anything else out there, and it's this stuff called Yokokansan or Yigansan. Um, it's covered under national health insurance in Japan for, for um, treatment of patients. It's like, like most traditional medicines, it's a mix of herbs. Um, Kangshu, Chinese egg, get angelica root, hare's ear root, um, Sichuan lobish root, licorice root, and stems of gambler vine. It was, uh, this kind of formula was published in the 1500s during the Ming Dynasty, and it was initially for babies that are very fretful. Uh, and, um, there actually are four randomized controlled trials of this stuff um, with about 240 subjects. What they showed was an improved NPI score and improved subscales for delusions, hallucinations, agitation, and aggression. Of about the same magnitude as the other drugs do. Um, improved ADLs, no change in mini middle score. So, um, when there were not very many toxicities, but the reported toxicities were hypokalemia and dysrhythmias, which you think about the licorice root and the uh, aldosterone axis actions of that, that wouldn't be surprising uh, that you get potassium in those alterations. But, I mean, this was as good an evidence as we see for a lot of other things. Um, in terms of treating the REM sleep behavior disorder, um, there was a, a state-of-the-art review in sleep one of the sleep journals and looking at all the evidence and clonazepam by far has the most evidence. Uh, 22 studies, about a 90% response rate. Uh, melatonin had six studies with about a 79% response and then paroxetine and pramipexol each had a few studies looking at them for that. Uh, their recommendations were all, you know, all the studies were evidence level four, so case control or case series. 
they give, gave a level B recommendation of clon for clonazepam or melatonin. And then a level A recommendation was given to modify the sleep environment to reduce risk of injury. So such things as putting the mattress on the floor, patting the corners of the furniture, making sure there's not wind glass that the person's going to break if they thrash around, removing dangerous objects. I mean, there, when I was looking, reading about REM sleep behavior disorder, there was a really interesting article. It was a very dapper man demonstrating this device he rigged up himself, kind of a thing around his waist that sort of tied him to the bed that, so he couldn't fling himself out. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, people are really smart and creative how they deal with these things sometimes, but um, so those safety, safety recommendations. So hindsight, um, would you what I, I, so I diagnosed this man with vascular dementia, modified his risk factors, what would, what would we do differently for Mr. Mr. C than what I did eight years ago? Yeah, yeah, and I, I probably would have considered the diagnosis of Lewy body dementia since he had every possible <coughs> symptom of it. Um, uh, so I would have considered treating his executive function impairment and depressive symptoms with surgery. <coughs> but I would have considered giving him uh, like Aricept or Rivastigmine. It might have helped. Um, and I would have considered probably first melatonin just because of safety. I would have tried to get him off the olanzapine um, and really even more emphasize the safety measure since it was the hip fracture that actually you know, was the cascade event that led to his death. So why it matters, it's again second most common cause of degenerative dementia, uh, has a poorer prognosis has a high prevalence of behavioral problems, which can cause caregiver burnout and can cause the, the individual to be institutionalized. It has a high prevalence of autonomic dysfunction that puts you at risk for medical complications and falls. It actually has a good response to treatment, better than, better than Alzheimer's disease does. So you know, there, are, there are actually useful things we can do. So, and then some final points. Um, so there's morbidity beyond just the cognitive decline. Uh, the imaging techniques are very accurate. We often don't usually actually need them to make the diagnosis, but, but they can be used. We have helpful treatments for these symptoms, <clears throat> and we need to anticipate the complications when we're working with the patients and their families. Falls, delirium, oh, that's a point. Often when we're doing consultations and, you know, at, with patients who have delirium or at risk for delirium, Sometimes the, the templates will say, you know, Haldol is needed. You really would prefer not to use Haldol in these patients. It's, it's you know, you, you probably use an atypical, even though there's less data for delirium with these. And, you know, be aware of drug tox toxicities and the stress on caregivers. I think that's, that's all I have. Yep, that's it. Okay, any, any questions? Anybody questions? questions? Um, you may have said this, but the Japanese medication is, is it available in the United States? You can get it online. I, oh, I, you okay. know, I have a really pretty picture of, of an ad for it, but yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, like I say, I have, I have a family member with this disease and or, you know, really difficult behavioral and psychological symptoms, and it's like I'm tempted to try it. I mean, you know, a ton of syrup. Well, a ton of well, syrup well, well, has not cured it, so yeah. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, it is available. Yeah. Any comments? Yes? Okay, well, thank you very okay. much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh,